Hello and welcome to this, my 24th CPD Coffee Time with me, Dr. Tina May. Today I'm going to focus on building therapeutic approaches using tools for motivational interviewing. Introducing myself just very briefly, many of you will know me as an educational and child psychologist, and I have also written prolifically, um, mainly for Hinton House Publishers in recent years, and also um, for Nurture Group Network, or Nurture UK as it's now called. And just to flag up that the resource I'm going to focus on um, in the second half of this presentation is just published this month um, as we speak. It's October, and hopefully people will be interested in, in having a look at this as a result of engaging in this session today. The aims are for us to understand the theory that underpins this approach to working therapeutically with children and young people, and to be aware of the individual steps involved in the process of motivational interviewing itself, being able to describe key features within this approach. Um, it's also an opportunity, hopefully, for you to familiarise yourself with a range of the techniques used in this particular approach and also consider for yourselves when it might be appropriate to implement these uh, with children and young people, both at an individual whole class level. So at the outset, just to highlight what we really already know about um, motivation itself, um, are there are key elements really, and these are the, the, the these are the key elements and, or characteristics of motivation. Um, much current research into this area is based on self-determination theory, which assumes that human beings are naturally motivated to explore and develop, but that this natural drive can be enhanced or diminished by external factors such as society, family or culture. Um, Self-determination theory suggests that motivation can be intrinsic or ex extrinsic and that people can be motivated to learn and develop either because of the pleasure or sense of achievement they get from the activity itself, i.e. intrinsic, or because of the rewards or consequences that are separate from, separate from that activity, i.e. extrinsic. Uh, basically, three, three factors we feel affect an individual's level of motivation, competence, autonomy and relatedness. And each of these is a basic need for human beings and whether they are met or frustrated will generally affect that individual person's motivation. Competence is the drive to feel able and successful. Autonomy means having control over your own life, being able to be yourself, which in, in the midst of this current pandemic is clearly something that many of us are finding difficult to access. Relatedness is the human need to interact with others and form relationships. So we know, for example, that parents, caregivers build up their children's self-esteem and self-worth by appropriate praise, giving suitable levels of responsibility for the child's age and developmental stage and by showing unconditional love and regard. And each of these is closely related to these needs that we all have for competence, autonomy and relatedness. So in terms of motivational interviewing, Miller and Rolnick describe it as a collaborative approach in which the counsellor or the therapist or the teacher or the mental health lead, whoever is taking on this role, evokes the person's own intrinsic motivation and resources to change, so i.e. the intrinsic motivation within ourselves. So this is in order to facilitate the natural change processes that are already inherent, they're inside of us, in each of us as an individual. And in essence, it's about helping to free people from the ambivalence that entraps them in repetitive cycles of self-defeating or self-destructive behaviour. So you can probably see the links back to our C CBT session and solution focus session here, but particularly the, the CBT and, and where we actually dispute irrational patterns of thinking, feeling and behaviour in order to actually try and break the cycle that, that keeps us trapped in those behaviours that are unhelpful to us. So what does it mean? This process of motivational interviewing is underpinned by this whole empathic approach. It's based upon cooperation between me and the child that I'm working with, mutual respect and a clear understanding of where they're coming from and their views and their perceptions. And it's also important to highlight the fact that motivation is actually 
in, if we think about it in this context, in this therapeutic approach, motivation is something that one does, not something that one has. So just stop and reflect on that for a wee bit. It's something that we do, not something that we have. Very interesting. Just slight switch there for many of us, I think, in our thinking. So the spirit of motivational interviewing. Four key areas, basically. Autonomy, so focusing on the client's choice, asking permission to provide assistance, information, support, collaborative working, okay? So it's autonomy. So it's, it's what that individual child or young person wants to gain from this particular process and relationship. Then it's collaboration. It's about us coming alongside with those kids, being non-judgmental and viewing them, so I see the patient, obviously this is, I'm thinking about it clinically as well, but viewing them, the patient or the child, as the expert on themselves. And then it's about evocation, so exploring what actually really motivates that individual and not making assumptions or presuming or judging in essence. And then of course it's the appreciation of ambivalence. Obviously, I'm going to come back to ambivalence um, in the course of the presentation, but I think initially now it's quite important to just think about our beliefs around motivation um, and whether or not that we feel that these are true or false. So here we go. We're going to go through two slides now looking at what people generally may or may not believe about motivation. So until a person is motivated to change, there's not much we can do. What I would like you to do, if you can, if you're working with colleagues or you've got the time to do this, is just to stop the presentation at this point, record these and then write down your thoughts or share your thoughts with each other as to whether or not you think these four statements are true or false. OK, so I'm going to actually give you what I feel are the correct answers here. So basically, I think the first one is, is false. OK, motivation is actually accessible. It can be modified or enhanced at many points in the change process. So the child or the client may not have to hit rock bottom in order to experience terrible, irreparable consequences of their behaviours to become aware of the need for change. They don't have to experience all this terrible damage in order to know or understand that they need to change. And what we can do is access and enhance a person's motivation to change well before extensive damage is done to health, relationships, reputation, self-image, etc. The second statement, it usually takes a significant crisis or hitting rock bottom to motivate a person to change. Uh, again, false. Sometimes it is how it happens, but usually we don't have to get to the worst possible point. And what we can do when we work with a child or young person or, or, or a client is to really access and enhance their motivation well before this damage is done. Um, and there are several types of experiences that may have effects either in increasing or decreasing motivation, such as in increased anxiety about the problem, a critical life event, um, cognitive evaluation or appraisal of the impact, for example, of substances in one's life can lead to change. So the weighing of pros and cons of, say, taking drugs or substance abuse in general, that accounts for 30 to 60 percent of the changes reported in, in natural recovery studies. Uh, recognising negative consequences and the harm or hurt that one's done can also help to motivate us to change. So thinking about a child who's really um, been very abusive towards a parent or a teacher, etc. Positive and negative external incentives. So supporting and empathic friends, rewards and various types of coercion may stimulate motivation for change as well. Uh, motivation is influenced by human connections. Well, this is true, clearly. Um, it belongs to one person, but it can un be understood to result from the interactions between the individual and other people or environmental factors. So we know that our, our readiness to change can really fluctuate um, over time. It can vary in intensity and it can falter in response to doubts that we have. But motivation can, to change can really be strongly influenced by friends, family, emotions and community support. The fourth one, resistance to change, arises from deep-seated defence me mechanisms. 
Well, again, this is false. Denial, rationalisation, resistance, arguing as assertions of personal freedom. They're common defence mechanisms that many people use instinctively to just protect themselves emotionally. So when um, clients or young people are labelled pejoratively as manipulative, I hate that word, alcoholic resistant, giving no voice in selecting their treatment goals, or directed authoritatively to do or not to do something, the result is pretty predictable, isn't it? And quite normal, really. It's the response of defiance. If you tell me, I will be defiant. OK, and additionally, of course, ambivalence is quite normal. OK, the next four. Again, I'd like you to just pause for a bit and write these down or just look at them and make your own notes or share with a colleague your responses to these. Do you think they're true or false? OK. So people choose whether or not they will change. Ultimately, this is true. It's, it's a personal choice. Although, in my view, change is the responsibility of both the client, the child, and many people change their behaviour on their own without therapeutic in intervention. We know this. But we can enhance the client or the child's motivation for beneficial change at each stage of the change process. Readiness for change involves a balancing of pros and cons. This is totally true. Ambivalence needs to be resolved before the change process can progress. And we're going to have a go at doing an ambivalence exercise in a moment. Creating motivation to change usually requires confrontation. False. Confrontation usually promotes resistance rather than motivation to change or cooperate. For example, much of the research into this um, approach suggests that the more frequently clinicians use adversarial confrontational techniques with substance using clients, the less likely they are to change. Denial is not a client problem, it's a therapist skill problem. True. Motivational interviewing views denial and resistance as behaviour evoked by environmental conditions, not, for example, as traits, characteristics of characteristic of a substance abuser, for example. Um, a direct comparison of counsellor styles suggested that a confrontational and directive approach may precipitate more immediate client resistance and, of course, ultimately, poorer outcomes than a client-centred or child-centred, supportive, empathic style that uses reflective listening and gentle, curious persuasion. So remember that, gentle, curious persuasion. So I hope this has actually just clarified perhaps some of the slight myths that we may have or the erroneous beliefs that some of us may have held about motivation. So this notion of ambivalence, what is it? Essentially, it's our friend, of course, in my view, because it's what we need to experience and feel before we can actually begin to make the change. I want to, but I don't want to. It's a natural phase in this process of change. And also it's a normal aspect of human nature. It's not pathological. It's the key issue to resolve um, for change to occur. So we need to resolve this ambivalence. So at this point in the exercise would be a useful idea if you just paused and took a piece of paper and a pen and actually made three columns, uh, writing down something in the first column that you're interested in doing, but you've got mixed feelings about it. So buying a new car, stopping smoking, exercising. Column two, write down all the negatives about doing this and making this change. Then reflect, how do you feel about this now? Next, in column three, write down all the positives about doing this and making this change and then reflect, how do you feel now? And consider for yourselves which of these lists is longer or more convincing and think about why you think that might be the case. And in addition to this, um, in order to really reinforce this notion of ambivalence, um, it might be useful for you, if you can, to work with a partner, if you are um, working and doing this together in a smaller group with your team, or perhaps just try and get one of someone in your home to actually engage in this activity with you. Um, each of you write down something that you're interested in doing, but you've got mixed feelings about. Again, as I said earlier in the first activity, buying a new car, stopping smoking, exercising, um, engaging in more um, self-care on a daily basis, etc. Then select who's going to speak first. So the speaker presents what it is that you'd like to do but haven't done yet. 
The listener then argues strongly in favour of one of the options or side. And for the speaker, your job is just to listen. Don't interrupt them, OK, as they argue strongly in favour of one side. Just note what you're thinking and feeling as they do this. Then have a go at switching roles and repeat the process. So then spend some time thinking about what were your thoughts and feelings as the speaker, as you were being persuaded either way. And then think about what actually happened in this conversation, which is probably not a conversation, it's someone actually giving you advice. Um, when ambivalence collides with persuasion, prescription and convincing, and of course that goes right back to the, the false belief that we can have that you actually um, can force someone to change by being argumentative with them. Actually, what it does is it makes you feel quite defensive. So just to reflect on that would be useful. And then think about how this impacts on us in our relationships with children when we're working with them, because one of the key elements of this today, I'm hoping, is that you will see this as a really useful, empathic, respectful process that we can use to support children effectively in behaviour change and increasing their motivation to change themselves. So in a nutshell, to summarise, a client-centred directive method for enhancing intrinsic motivation to change by exploring and resolving ambivalence, the ambivalence that you just explored and attempted to resolve. And many applications, um, I have to say, in, in the main, this is to do usually in, in a clinical setting with trying to support people who have addictions of some kind or another. So lots of different applications and an evidence base for all of them is evident. So key principles here, um, avoiding arguing, rolling with resistance, expressing empathy, dis developing discrepancy and supporting self-efficiency. Arguments we know are counterproductive and defending breeds defensiveness. So very important that we avoid that. Resistance is a signal to change strategies and labelling is actually unnecessary for change. Uh, we also, this rolling with resistance, momentum can be used really to good advantage and perceptions can be shifted, but we have to roll with that resistance. So we, we invite new perspectives, but we don't impose them. And supporting self-efficiency, that belief is in the possibility of change, is a really important motivator. So the client or young person is responsible for choosing and carrying out personal change. And they should present the arguments, in essence, for making that change. So we're now going to focus on the individual in the change process and the process of change itself. And this slide presents Prokaska and Di Clemente's stages of change models. So pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance and relapse. I'm going to go through each of these in turn to briefly describe what they mean. So pre-contemplation, I see no problems to address at this time. I'm not even really thinking about it. I know perhaps maybe there's a need for change, but I don't want to kind of think about it, not now. I've not really given much thought to this. So at this point, our role as a therapist or the practitioner working with a child or young person is just to bring awareness to the issue and encourage some engagement from the child or young person or client. Telltale signs that someone's not ready. They, they start to argue or disagree with your assessment. They're resistant to offers of assistance. Um, they may express denial of the problem or communicate a real sense of hopelessness or learned helplessness about the particular situation. So at the contemplation stage, we're kind of thinking about it. Yeah, I've thought about I need to get a bit fitter or healthier, but I'm not quite ready to change yet. So this is the ambivalence period. This is when we will be thinking about pros and cons, increasing awareness about the options for benefits of change. So and, and it's really about focusing on positive change and what the benefits would be. Preparation, determination. So, OK, I'm making my mind up here and preparing here. I'm, I'm thinking I need to make some changes. So what we would be doing there is supporting them to decrease barriers to change by providing resources, information, offering assistance, a certain level of advice, but addressing the issues of self-efficiency. So it's about them taking control here and being in charge of what they're intending to do. So action willpower. Um, I know I need to make some changes. I've, I've had to make changes before and I did it. So our role there is about encouraging this movement. Um, and this 
action stage really is the one at which people most overtly modify their behaviour. It's a really busy period. It's one that requires a level of commitment in terms of time and energy for, from both the young person or the client and the facilitator or therapist. So once the decision has been made to change behaviour, shared contracts and targets can be negotiated with the young person or the client and jointly monitored, allowing them to take increased responsibility for their own behaviour management. So solution focused techniques are really useful here. So please make reference back to my session on solution focused approaches. But the, ex the, the questions that we might be asking them will, will be to help them explain and evaluate what impact it is actually having on their lives. So, you know, what is better since we last met? Who's noticed? What did they say? Who's doing what? What are they doing instead of the problem? How will you know when when things have improved? How will you know that the problem is solved? How will you know that when you are happier? Um, is McNamara um, proposes that a young person, for example, should have an opportunity to make a public commitment to change even. Um, they ought to receive confirmation and support from, for their plan and should be given external feedback on how they're progressing. So positive reinforcement and feedback may help to back up this commitment to change. And of course, that happens within the therapeutic relationship. Then, of course, there's maintenance, keeping it going, helping them to maintain positive focus. So I, I've, I know I've made some changes. This is really, really good. You know, so at this point, um, it's useful to do maybe some troubleshooting about what might happen if there is a relapse and the child or young person or the client goes back to their previous behaviour. So useful questions we can ask, really useful ones are, you know, what is better? What helped you to achieve it? How did you manage it? How did you get through that time? So what did it take to do that? Um, how confident are you about keeping this up? So you could use confidence scaling, not to 10, how confident on that scale, um, in order to help the child or young person assess this, again, in line with solution focused approaches. What does this tell you about yourself now that you didn't know before? Uh, what would be the first sign that will tell you things are really beginning to slip back possibly? And of course, there is relapse, uh, the final part of the uh, change process. So, you know, I was doing really well, I thought, but then I got tired of having to focus so much energy on caring for my house, so I just quit. Or I was doing really, really well, I was really focusing my maths lessons, but, you know, then the teacher said something horrible to me, so I thought, well, that's it, I'm not going to bother anymore, I'm just going to be disruptive again, because I'm fed up with it. Um, really important that at this point, we have to normalise relapse is okay. It's a normal part of the process of change. And that reduces the level of shame because, of course, that's what we feel when we've kind of relapsed and gone back. If I try to stop smoking and I've I had a, a you know bad evening and I've, I've gone back and had a few cigarettes and then the next day I feel so guilty and, and fed up and ashamed of myself. I haven't given in to that again. But we need to be authentic and really encourage this open discussion at this point. Um, I'm really continue to assist in this sort of re-exploration, I suppose, of these goals, reformulating them and helping them to develop these strategies that they need to re-engage. Um, I think it's really, really important. I mean, if we're preparing them for relapse as well, I think that's a key element here that we should be doing. So, you know, if you relapse, who's going to listen, understand, how will you be able to tell that person? And also stopping and thinking. Um, it might be helpful to find out from the young person whether they've strategies to stop the problem from escalating. So that will give us a, a real insight into the coping strategies they've already got in place. So, you know, what are you going to do now for to stop things from getting worse? Um, what's keeping it from really getting worse at this stage? So just to remind you of the stages of change. OK, this is the model. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparing for change putting it into practice and then trying to maintain it and then relapse just because the next slide there's a wee activity in which I'm going to ask you to try and judge which stage of the change someone is at. So if you're working with a colleague or you are on your own, um, be useful to again stop the presentation at this point and just look through Ellie's problem and try to work out um, what stage in the change process Ellie is at as she makes these particular 
um, assessments or statements or actions. OK, so Ellie loves a glass of wine after working, doesn't realise that this has become a problem for her. So actually, at this stage, my, I'm going to give you the we answer here to the first one. It's called she's pre-contemplative. She's not really thinking about making the change yet. So work your way through them just so that you, you feel confident in being able to assess where someone is at in this stage process. Um, of change, but also thinking about children and young people, because this is a very, very useful skill to develop, because then we know what to do in terms of questioning and support at each stage, if you refer back to the previous slides. So, just to reinforce, there are four key processes of motivational interviewing. Engaging with the young person or the client, listening to understand them, active listening to understand. Focusing, so setting the agenda, finding a common and strategic focus where you will explore the ambivalence. I do or don't want to change. I, I'm going to explore that. Offering information and advice at that point. Then evoking, so selective eliciting, responding, summaries towards change talk. And then planning, moving toward commitment and change. So we're going to go through each of those in turn. So at the first one, engaging, building a therapeutic alliance. We, I, I love this acronym, acronym ORS. Okay, open-ended questions are what we would use. Affirmations, she, you know, just reaffirming that that person has value and that what they're trying to do is wonderful and correct and right and it's 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 useful. But affirming them as an individual who um, needs to have their self-esteem uh, protected, but also recognise that they are someone um, of value. Reflective listening, real reflective listening and summaries, really, really important. We'd also talk about these in a wee bit more depth. So ORS, open-ended questions to elicit change talk. So some of the things we might be asking, what are some of your reasons for decreasing your alcohol intake? That's desire. How might you go about decreasing your use of cannabis or other drugs? That's your ability. What do you see some benefits for following the rules in school? reasons. OK, so open ended questions. Affirmations. I'd like to say genuine affirmations here, really. So it's about being authentic. So use to encourage that individual to see their own resources, affirming them as a human being. So they've got to be personal and genuine, genuine, exploring the partial successes. Again, solution focus, those we exceptions and attempts and intentions. So highlighting their attributes, their efforts. I'm really glad you decided to come into talk with me today. Reflective listening, so paraphrasing um, comments, um, really, really important. I, I think this is a skill that many of us need to continue to develop. About It's about being curious and not actually making judgments or interpreting in the wrong way. So it sounds as if you're a bit concerned about how to make healthy choices. It sounds as if you're a bit concerned about your um, interactions with that particular teacher in that subject area. And then summaries, really effective. So let me make sure I heard you correctly. See, this is respectful. It's about just making sure that I've really understood what you said. Um, because if I, I kind of repeat it back to you, then maybe you can confirm with me that I got that right. OK, so again, respectful there. And then focusing, targeting one area. So identifying a strategic focus. So what is it we really want to work on here? So exploring their motivation, but really listening all the time to their language, the narrative, and picking out those bits where you think, ah, I can hear some language here, which really makes me think they are beginning to be motivated. Offer and share information. So ask permission, elicit, provide, elicit. So, Conversation summaries could be transitional or a key question. So a transitional summary. So, all right, if I can just summarise what we've spoken about, you're confused about the reasons for it. It's been difficult to make the change since and you feel unprepared. So would you like more information, some ideas that may work for, for you, uh, things that maybe have worked for others in the past? Key question. Where do you want to begin with information about this or ways to make the change or how? to approach it. OK, again, that's giving a sense of autonomy to the child or young person or client. And goals and values. Again, this is a very, very um, useful part of the whole process and one which sometimes I think um, some clinicians um, don't 
possibly focus on to the extent that might be really helpful to some of the clients. OK, it's really, really important that we actually um, really um, encourage children and young people to identify personal goals and targets and aims for themselves. Um, they're discussed um, goals and values in Bill Miller's book on sudden change. It's called Quantum Change, When Epiphanies and Sudden Insights Transform Ordinary Lives, published in 2001 by Guildford Press. So I do think it's, it's important, um, really kind of moving away from this at, the, at this moment in time, but just think about your life dreams, goals, values. And this can relate to really bigger issues and it can usually prompt or have visual aids that reflect common values so and goals like work, family relationships, spirituality, community. Um, I think the thing is for some of our kids, it's not always done this setting of goals in a smart manner. And some are rarely goals are rarely separated out into long term and short term initiatives. And we know from much of the research that actually the step by step next step approach is really, really important. And clarifying and specifying the action steps is vital. Um, so reflecting on a behaviour that the child wants to change, um, identifying that, writing a personal goal and using SMART criteria is really important. So stating the problem, what is it that you want to do different, clarify it, presenting it in the form of a how to statement. And then the long term goal, what would be different in your life if you change your behaviour and how will you know things are better for you and others around you? But, you know, stopping to pause and think and reflect on these bigger issues, life dreams, goals and values is really important. And I love that. Tell me the most important areas for you in this. You know, tell me about your life dreams. Tell me about your ideal future, what you would like to be, to do, to feel, to think. Rolling with resistance, um, affirming and accepting the fears that the child or client may have, reflecting on other people's concerns, reframing the concerns to positive movement and offering assistance. These are really key, key skills. Um, and I think it's really important. Resistance in, in young people and children can be one of the most challenging and frustrating issues to deal with. And it usually occurs when freedom of choice is being threatened. So, for example, in criminal justice concept, uh, context, you know, coercion into treatment can be a clear source of resistance. So where possible, it's really important that we can encourage children and young people to reflect on the choices they have and involve them as much as possible in the decision making process. Reflection and expression of empathy can really help the young person to talk about their loss of choice. So there are some key issues, I think, in working with resistance or rolling with resistance. So our style as someone who's working therapeutically with a young person can be a powerful determinant of their resistance and motivation to, to change. If we argue, that will provoke resistance. And if we you know, are confrontational, young people may respond to this by presenting the reasons against change. And they tend not to change, obviously, as I said earlier, when resistance is pr pr provoked in this way. And this resistance, very often we have to be curious about this. Very often this is about a young person um, being resistant because we don't understand them. That's how they feel. We don't understand them or their situation. And motivation emerges from the interaction with us and that child or young person. So we, we need to in increase it. This is part, as I said, right at the start when we were looking about uh, some of the um, kind of errors of judgment that we make around motivation. There's, a, there's something about us taking responsibility here. We have a real key goal, I think, in avoiding or reinforcing resistance. Um, and this is known as rolling with resistance. And reflection can be used to reduce resistance and employed by us as a way to work with rather than against this energy of resistance. So it's, it's really key. It's our problem as the therapist or the practitioner working with the young person. It's our problem to overcome this resistance, not the client or the child. OK, um, sometimes it's very simple, you know, just acknowledging their disagreement, their emotions, their perceptions, because if we do that, acknowledge it, you know, without being judgmental, that can further the conversation rather than promote defensiveness. Reflecting back what they've said, um, if we can exaggerate the point, but with a quiet, understated tone. 
and sometimes you know that the young person may back off a bit you know if we're very gentle about it and they might articulate then the other side of the ambivalence and also always acknowledging what that child or young person has said and including the other side of the issue with the aim of increasing ambivalence. So the assessment and planning stage is we, we summarise where the child or the client is with regard to making change. We develop a goal and action plan. We explore and build their confidence, autonomy using affirmations. We address the real and perceived barriers or challenges and then we schedule follow up. So in terms of working with a child or young person, I usually work through three specific stages, defining the problem, gaining their perspective and agreeing with them about this problem, what it is, and actually defining it jointly, collaboratively together. Then identifying what motivates them and then avoiding giving advice or educating them. OK, so three steps, basic steps for initially working with the young person. So just translating it for the young person, the pre-contemplative stage, there's nothing wrong with how I behave, it's the teachers who can't handle it, they've got the problem, not me. And at this point, we would engage with the alls process, so open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective questions and summaries. And some basic do's and don'ts with a, with a child. So we do ask, what are the good things about your behaviour? How has it helped you? What do you gain from behaving like that? What's the most important thing in your life? How does your behaviour fit with your long term goals? Are there things you don't like about the, your behaviour? How has it stopped you from doing what you want to do? Is there anything at school that you'd like to be different? What we don't do is ask question after question with short answers. We don't like act as if we are the expert. Sorry, that should say expert. We're not. We don't label the people. We don't judge and we don't blame them clearly. This would be absolutely evident to anyone who works with children and young people therapeutically. When they're thinking about this, you know, the child they're contemplating now at the next stage, I can see why it might be helpful for me to change my behaviour. But at the same time, I'm not sure I want to change. So again, always remember that we move backwards and forwards with them in our engagement. And we really think about confidence and the importance of what they want to do and focus on that. So again, the do's and don'ts at this stage. We will be asking them what makes you want to change? What's different about you now that means you want to change compared to before? What makes you think you could change if you tried? Can you tell me about the time when your behaviour wasn't a problem and how it made you feel? So again, consistent with solution focused exception finding processes. What would your future look like in the next five years if you make this change? What might be hard about making it? So just that hint about, you know, possible relapse in the future and preparing for it. What we don't do is give advice or problem solve or make suggestions at this stage. We certainly don't talk about our own experience. I think this is an absolute taboo in the therapeutic relationship. We ignore the negatives. We don't ignore the negatives. Um, we only focus on the positives. No, we don't. We don't do either of those. So at the preparation stage, the child may be saying, I'm seriously considering actually changing my behaviour, miss. We look at the pros and cons, again, that, that ambivalence exercise. We may use imagery and visualisation of what it might be like in the future when we're preparing for this. And we also are very clear about planning one step at a time. We might make use of the miracle question at this stage. And again, we've I've made reference to this in the solution focused session. Um, and this is around, you know, you, you wake up tomorrow morning and everything is exactly how you'd like it to be. The changes have been made. Talk me through your day. Start with stepping out of bed. What happens? What does it look like? How do you feel? Um, you might want to do that saying, you know, how do you feel at every you know, hourly period during the day? What's happening? What's different? But then obviously what you're going to be doing is then going back and saying, how is that different from a normal day? And then thinking about shifting, how could you make this more of a reality? What do you need to do? What needs to change for you and in your context in order to allow that to happen? As we're preparing, we think about other options, pros and cons of each of them, what the consequences might be, how other people might react to the change. What do you think you'll do? What will you do first? Who will help you with it? Who's been able to help in the past? But we don't just accept the first tentative decision as a final one. Obviously, we don't bring our own experiences in again. I have to keep reinforcing this. Uh, we certainly don't argue with them over what we think they should do or assume that we have the same goals or desired outcomes for that individual child or young person. At the active change 
stage, this is when the child or young person puts the decision into practice, okay? And really important that we share the contracts and targets with them. We negotiate them at this stage, okay? And again, using solution-focused techniques can really help to establish what is helpful to the young person. So asking them questions that help them to explain and evaluate what impact it's having on their lives. So this is the stage where the child will really be overtly changing their behaviour. And again, questions that we could ask at this stage. What's better since we last met? Who's noticed? What did they say? Who's doing what? What are, what are you doing instead of this happening or the problem? How will you know when it's improved or you've improved? How will you know that the problem's actually solved? How will you know when you are happier? And then there's maintenance, actively maintaining the change. So if the child then we can ask them what's better, what's helped you to achieve it, how did you manage it, how did you get through it that time? So what did it take to do that? How confident are you now about keeping this up? So you can then do a scaling, confidence scaling again to help the child or young person. What does this tell you about yourself that you didn't know before? What would be the first sign that will tell you things are beginning to slip back? So you're trying to maintain it by focusing on all the things that are working well and how to keep those going. But at the same time, there's that little element of saying, you know, what would let you know it, it was slipping back that you've got to be really alert to? And then, of course, relapse, the final part of the change process. So providing it's anticipating, anticipated, and you've given the right support and encouragement. This can be temporary, of course, but for many of us and the child or young person. And what we can do here is explore barriers to change. And if appropriate, some strategies weighing up the pros and cons of behavioural change, you can use those again at this stage. And obviously we want to prepare them for this, okay? We want to make sure that they're really aware of the fact that it's a normal part of the process. Um, and they don't need to be feeling shame about it. And if they do experience a sense of anger or self-doubt, that what we do is we actually reinforce the fact that that's good because that actually prompts us to continue on the change process. It motivates us again. So you can ask them if you relapse, who do you think will listen or understand? Where can you get some support from? How will you be able to tell them? And also stopping and thinking, it may be helpful to try and find out from them whether they've got some strategies to stop it from getting worse again. And that will give us, as the therapist or the facilitator, an insight into what coping mechanisms and strategies they've already put in place themselves. So what are you doing to stop things from getting worse? What's keeping it from getting worse? So tell me about those. What strategies have you got? Who else can help? So um, hopefully I've given you... Um, an overview of the process and how it works and how you might engage with a child or young person individually. Um, I'm also now going to make reference to the new publication Motivation Matters just out from Hinton Publishers. Um, and again, I'm really, really pleased that this has come out at this juncture because I think more than ever our children are going to need to feel motivated um, and to understand the process of change, behaviour change, because they are experiencing such heightened levels of stress and anxiety around transitions with the COVID pandemic and difficulties and differences and the need for huge amounts of flexibility in the way in which they're going to school and accessing the curriculum. So alongside a comprehensive inter introduction to motivation itself as a process, and a really good um, grounding into the process of motivational interviewing. So that's really quite comprehensive. So if you do want to access this, I think it's a really, really helpful read. There is then a student programme. And what this is designed to do in 10 sessions is to support children and young people in gaining an understanding of motivation and how it works and impacts and how they can become more motivated in, in terms of um, behaviour change for themselves. But also takes them through the process of actually using these key tools and mechanisms to engage in behaviour change with each other. So they become each other's motivationers, motivational interviewers, and we take them through the, the process. So there's the first initial sessions are obviously introductory, looking at positive possibilities, looking at ourselves, developing listening skills, authentic 
empathic listening skills and the, the ability to summarise, to cooperate effectively, to reflect back, to paraphrase um, and really and understand what active listening actually is and practice it. And then we look at the stages of change and describe those and they understand them and are, are used to actually then um, making use of those in terms of reflecting upon their own behaviour change processes. We do some pro problem solving in session eight and use frameworks for that and actually look at changes that they want to make and how to set really good short term and long term goals. And one thing I do think is important just to just highlight at this stage is to remember motivational interviewing and building motivation in our children, young people. It is not about us. OK, the responsibility lies with that individual client or that young person and what they actually feel they need in their lives. You know, I'm a real believer in informed consent in the therapeutic relationship. And I think that we have been. Um, sometimes uh, not actually really adhering to this principle in our work when it comes to kids. Um, have they really given their consent to what we're doing with them and for them? Do they really understand the process? Um, I think we need to reflect on that more deeply, I think. Our role in this process is to be active, caring observers who are present to help that client or that child or young person. And we know this is because individual behaviours can change over time. We need to remain vigilant then about checking in each time we meet that child or young person or client. So just to give you a, a wee flavour of, of what um, the, the, the book is in terms of actually the, the programme for the children, young people, just, I'm going to give you a few of the examples from the sessions of the activities. So in session one, we do an activity called What Change? Um, and the children are asked, what do you think you need to change about yourself? What do others think? And they're asked to complete a chart which is um, trying to empathise with others. So understanding how the importance of that. So thinking about how you can understand other people's real feelings towards you and how they make you feel as an individual child, young person, student. And we look at how um, they, they answer these questions in terms of a teacher, a close friend and a parent carer. And they're asked to identify what they, those individuals would want me to change, why I think they'd want me to change and how they might feel if I made this change. In session five, making resolutions, um, this is quite interesting. Who decides if we have a problem, ourselves, our parents or our teachers? So again, this is about ensuring that they understand um, the difference between someone else's perceptions of our problem and our own perceptions. Are you more or less likely to solve your problem if you feel that you own it and have made the decision to change yourself? So again, there's the format for this and they can record their answers. And the idea is that they share and discuss this so that they gain a shared understanding of making resolutions. And of course, we know exploring ambivalence is a key central part to this whole process of change. So we do an ambivalence exercise and exploration of it in session six. You've been informed that from the start of next term, all students will be required to wear a uniform to school. They're going to be provided by the school. Everyone's going to be wearing the same navy blue track suit for winter and a thinner, breathable version for the summer. Be the same for both genders. So what's your first reaction? How do you feel about this? Use the rating scale. Are you strongly opposed to the change or are you totally ready and willing to accept it? So no change. Yes, change. And their rating is. And then they do the pros and the cons. What would be the benefits of this to you as individual children, young people in the school? What would be the cons or the things that are not so good about it? And then think, have you changed your mind? So it's a, an ambivalence exercise specifically designed for the students. And this is quite a useful one again from session nine using a script. And this is part of actually trying to maintain you know, the maintenance part of the change process to maintain the changes. So um, trying to um, change our behavior, sometimes it's useful to have this script. So, for example, if I want to stop smoking, I might actually have a script. No, I don't need this at this moment. I'm going to go and do something else to avoid it. I'll do some exercise. I will visualize myself as a healthy non-smoker. So just the process of writing that script down. And of course, it'll only begin to work if the motivation to give up has come from the person and it's not a challenge imposed by others. So again, reinforcing that. So the children, young people are asked to think of one habit 
or behaviour that they'd like to break or change and then think up a script to use in the situation. So it's almost like an affirmation. OK, so very useful strategy to develop a technique to put in their well-being toolboxes. And then developing your goal. And of course, this is hugely important. Smart targets, realistic goals, small steps, short term and longer term. So who will help me do this? What will be achieved? Where will I do this? Get help? Do best? Why am I doing this, making this change? So a bit more philosophical kind of thinking about it. When will I know I've achieved my goal? And what's my review date? How will I know I'm successful or need to evaluate? and try again, i.e. relapse is a normal part of this process and we need to plan for it. So, when might you use this approach? Obviously, with individual cases, children, young people, as part possibly of an initial assessment when we're working with a child or young person, um, understanding behaviours through to understanding your own responses as well for us in terms of actually understanding the way in which we're interacting with children, young people is, is useful and also possibly systemic changes within a school or family um, context. Um, I think it's, it's really, really useful to think about it as well as actually supporting children and young people generally um, at a whole group class form group level. I'm thinking about changes that they might want to make um, systemically to the environment in which they find themselves. So I think it's wide reaching, but I do think it's probably one of, alongside CBT, one of the most um, used um, therapeutic approaches in my own work. I tend to use a combination of solution focused, motivational interviewing and CBT approaches. And the, the overlaps are clearly evident, I think. So it, may, it might be useful to make reference back to the other two um, sessions that I've developed on solution focused and CBT. But you can see that this approach is hugely useful. And I really hope that this has been giving you a very clear overview and a basic understanding of the process. So a final quote, basically, just to leave you with something to reflect on. People are always more motivated by what comes out of their mouths than what comes out of yours. The exception to the rule on this is when what you say is a repetition of what they've said. Benjamin Franklin. So the reference is um, hugely useful. Please, Milner and Rolnick, obviously seminal here, McNamara and Atkinson, Kathy Atkinson, huge amount of work in this particular area. But also when I'm talking about motivation, uh, please look obviously at Jackie and Ryan, Jackie and Ryan Intrinsic Motivation and Self-Determination Theory. Very, very important underpinning this. Thanks again for listening. And I really hope this has been a useful session and given you an introductory um, overview, I suppose, of the motivational interviewing process, but also possibly some kind of greater insight into motivation itself. So please make use of the reference list if you, if you want to delve into this um, in, in additional depth. Um, and please do have a look at the Hinton House publication because I think it's hugely user friendly. And obviously what I've done there is included all the resources, ideas, strategies that I have used with children, young people over sadly many years. So thanks again for listening and I hope you join me for the next session in this series.